Happy Monday. It's no one asked us. He's Craig. I am Logan. Uh, Craig is showing Sorry. off his cardinal Sorry. shirt. And I'm about ready to hit leave meeting. Uh, and he can do the rest <laughs> of this thing by himself. Um, no one wants that. Yeah. I don't know. They might. They might. Some of the people might prefer a Craig solo show. Um, That's what we can put in the comments. Hashtag Team Craig. Hashtag Team Logan. I don't want to know. Put it in thing. the comments. I don't want to know. <laughs> uh, no one asked us. Uh, episode I don't know anymore. Season two. Uh, recording this December 12th. 83. Uh, is that number correct? Yes. Episode 83. It's like you don't trust our producer. I don't. I do not trust our producer. <laughs> our producer can't text me back. Um, but that's fine. I feel like I've been better since I put on read receipts because I know I I got a text. You You have been. (laughs) Episode 83, uh, December 12th, uh, just a couple of weeks away from Christmas. So you know that I am, um, you know, living my best life. Um, But we're here. We're here. We got things to talk about. It's going to be a weird episode today, uh, I think, of this show. Um, Some strange things in the news. This is our first episode, really, without a lot of college football to talk about. So. In theory, this could be a shorter show. Uh, we'll see if that actually um, pans out that way. We'll talk about some Illini Hoop stuff uh, after the weird roller coaster of a week they had. Um, all that other stuff. We'll talk about Illini football, gearing up for the bowl game, some postseason awards, some other things in the world of college football. And then, of course, uh, Major League Baseball offseason. Uh, the hot stove really heated up this week with the winter meeting. So we'll talk about all that stuff. Uh, of course, before we get into this thing, uh, like, share, subscribe, all of that stuff. Um, still looking to grow this page. We've had some uh, Alania postgame shows the last few weeks that have gone pretty well for the most part. Um, but we're still looking to to get more Saturday uh, was followers. not one of those. Yeah, Saturday, Saturday was not one of those. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, share, subscribe. Uh, follow us on all of our, so- all of our social media uh, he's at Craig W. Choate. I'm at the Logan Lee. Our show is at No One Asked Us Pod. Um, Craig, how you doing? You good? You've had some time to digest what happened on Saturday. Um, how how you feeling? Where are you at in the world? Before we get into spe- the specifics, how you how you doing? How you feeling? I'm doing great. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. went home this weekend. A uh, quick trip home for a day yep. and. Came back and we're good. We're good. I saw that you were back in the mecca of high school basketball, also known as Duster Thomas Gymnasium in the heart of downtown Pinckneyville, Illinois. Yeah, it's it's quite a it's quite a facility. I will I will admit that it's got certainly... a new video board this year. That's new incredible. Court, new paint job on the court. Yeah, visiting as somebody that grew up in Central Illinois mostly in East Central Illinois, going to Vermilion Valley Conference schools and a few others. Um, my four years that I spent um, visiting Southern Illinois high school gymnasiums was it a real culture shock. Um, a because lot different. It's a lot different. What the? F- it's not even that they're all that much bigger schools than what I was used to. Pinckney Mill is not that much bigger of a school than – you know, the Oakwoods and the schools that I grew up going to, you know, to see games at, but it's just a very different environment. Um, It's crazy how you just go a couple hours South and um, the, this, the atmosphere and the gyms, gymnasiums are just so much different, but yes, Pickneyville is certainly one of the best. Yeah. Uh, I also ventured. I noticed too, when I got in TV up there, I would go cover games on Friday nights. I would walk into gyms like, this is my junior high gym. Like, uh-huh. what is this? This place, no offense to those high schools in the Central pit? Illinois. You're referring to the this pit? This place sucks. I don't know who the pit is. That's Oakwood. Oakwood I think I only did one or two games in Oakwood. I rarely went to Oakwood. Yeah. It's, uh, but it's an experience. Yeah, they all experience. got, they got like stages on the side and all then the bleachers are on the op. Like, yeah. I, I, yeah, didn't like it. Yeah. Didn't care much for the high school gyms in Central Illinois. It's, it's very Sorry. different. It is just very different um, from central Illinois to southern Illinois. It's... So you've been to Pinckneyville? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I spent my Friday nights in college doing sunrise sports, and I was going out to high school football games and high school basketball games. And, yeah, I mean, I've I've been inside um, a lot of the high schools down there. Pinckneyville, DuCoin, oh. Carbondale, Marion, West Frankfurt, um, Heron. 
I didn't know that. Um, Murfreesboro, like I, yeah, I went inside a lot of those gyms, um, and they were all not all, but like significantly, just put some of the Central Illinois high schools to shame. But yeah. um, I also ventured home for the weekend. Got to see some family. Got to do a couple things. We talked about the basketball game that I was at on Saturday, and we'll we'll touch on that a little bit more. Uh, got to see a junior high basketball game on Thursday night. That was an experience. Um, Oakwood Oakwood Junior High had a pretty good eighth grade team. Uh, player in particular who's very talented, very skilled, and very tall for his age. So he should be playing varsity basketball as an eighth grader. Um, but uh, but yeah, that was that was my weekend. So uh, let's get into that. Uh, what I did on Friday was I went to uh, an Illinois basketball game, and uh, we have Saturday morning. I did that on Saturday morning. Uh, <laughs> Illinois basketball. Uh, um, I'll preface this by saying, yes, we have done post-game shows for both of these games, both the Texas game and the Penn State game. So if you're looking for our full yeah. thoughts and reactions and recaps, uh, I invite you to go check those videos out or those podcasts out if that's how you're listening to this. Um, but let's just kind of recap it. So Illinois, um, last Tuesday night, went to Madison Square Garden against the number two team in the country. Texas, the Texas Longhorns, and their head coach, Chris Beard, who we'll, we'll touch on his him in a little bit, probably. Um, and Illinois Whoa. beats Texas in overtime. Illinois was the number 16 team in the country at the time, I believe, 16 or 17. Uh, Texas 17. was number two. Um, Illinois probably didn't really deserve to be in that game. Texas probably should have ran them out of the gym, but they couldn't get it together. And Illinois was able to fight back in regulation and then take the game in overtime. Uh, Matthew Meyer was huge in that game, uh, was really uh, flourishing under the lights at, in New York at Madison Square Garden. Um, came back from at least 10 points uh, to win that. Um, and then Terrence Shannon Jr., who was essentially non-existent for the whole, for the first I'd say 30 minutes of that game, um, 35 minutes of that game, uh, really took over towards the end of regulation and then in overtime. This is where he scored most of his points in that game. Uh, but he led Illinois to a win on Tuesday night. A uh, huge win for the program um, against, as I've already said, the number two team in the country. At that point, you're looking to skyrocket up into the rankings. You already have a win over UCLA uh, and then a win over Texas. And then Saturday happens, and Illinois returns home for a morning tip-off, 11 o'clock Central Time, against a experienced yet not very good Penn State team, and the Illini absolutely lay an egg, and they fall to Penn State 74-59. to um, Not a lot of positives to take away from that game. Um I didn't mention it in the show. I forgot about it, but the good that I should have mentioned was the, the about 13 year old girl who played the national anthem on her violin to start the game. That was the best part of it and everything else. Went All downhill, downhill from that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was the roller coaster of a week. Uh, Illinois at this point just moves down a spot to 18 in the polls and get ready to play Alabama and M this coming Saturday after finals week. So Craig, uh, how are you feeling? How are you feeling about Illinois basketball now? You've had a couple of days to let the Penn State game kind of sit. Um, do you feel better or worse than where you did a week ago? Uh, last Monday, before uh, Texas. Last Monday, before Texas. Would you I say at, right, at this point, do you feel better about this team or worse about this team than you did a week ago? Probably a little worse. Probably a little bit worse. Not a whole lot, just a little because it was at home against an inferior opponent and it wasn't even a fight. Like it was, there was one, one rally in there to get it to five and then another fake rally later that got it to back to 12. Um, Penn State exposed Illinois a little bit. Very they, much so. They exposed a lot of holes. Um, how showed you how to beat the the defense, how to beat the switch, everything defense. Um, showed that if they're not going to help in the post, just post your guards, and um, Illinois can't stop you. Um, 
I would say a little bit worse. Not a whole lot. I still think this is a tournament team. This has the potential to be a second weekend team. Like expectations haven't changed. Um, but I'm a little more concerned that that this might not be the team to do that. Um, but it hasn't changed expectations uh per se. I, I'm with you for the most part. Um I think that I think yes, what happened on Saturday is it's less than ideal. Um, that's a game that you really can't afford to lose. Um, and it's a game that eventually, as I said in the post game show, will probably cost you a seed line. Um, but with that being said, I was very impressed with what I saw in the Texas game. And right. I can't firmly say that I feel better now than I did a week ago because of what happened on Saturday. But I don't know that I I think while you probably lean a little more feel worse, I probably lean a little more feel better. But I don't think we're far off from each other. Um, this team, as you said, is is very talented. There's there is a lot of talent on this basketball team, a lot of guys that can do a lot of things. And you're going to run into these. Um, I mean, it was. It was it was inevitable. You're going to lose games like no one's you're not going to run the table here Um, to that point. You had only suffered the one loss to Virginia or I guess two losses because you lost, also lost to Maryland. So now you're 0-2 to start Big Ten play. Um, You're going to run into these games where you just get outplayed. And this team, we have kind of been pleasantly surprised by to start this season about how they have seemed to have meshed together better than and quicker than I think anybody thought. Uh, they have had moments and games where certain individuals have really taken over. And that's been good to see. I think this is the true, I think this is who this team, this team truly is. Um, they are still going to be a work in progress. Uh, we have been over the flaws that this team has. Um, we thought that Syracuse might um, be an issue, but Fortunately, Coleman Hawkins was having his one of his best nights that particular night, and he 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 led Illinois to that to that win. Um, Penn State brought out a lot more issues than I think Illinois thought that they probably had, and that's probably a good thing. I think you'd rather have this game now than you would in February. Um, not to say that they won't lose a game like this in February uh, because they certainly can and they certainly might, but these are good learning experiences to have in December because there's a lot of season to be played ahead. Yes. Could this game cost you a seed line? Sure. Absolutely. But this conference is not particularly, I don't want to say particularly strong because I think it is a very strong conference. We, we've seen that in the rankings, but I don't think there's a team in this conference that I look at and say, Illinois can't beat this team. Um, Illinois may not be able to stop Zach Eady. Illinois might have trouble with Hunter Dickinson and Trace Jackson Davis. And there's going to be other situations. We've already seen what happened at the, on the road at Maryland, but they at least fought through that Maryland game. I wasn't bothered that they lost a game on the road at Maryland to start big 10 play with this basically all new team. Like that game did not bother me at all. This one's a little more bothersome, but I don't think I'm worried because of it. I think all these things that they figured out, they can correct and they can figure out two things came to mind as you were speaking. Okay. Um, it showed you, you kind of just said this verbatim, Illinois can beat any team in the country, but they can also lose, also lose. any, yeah. but maybe two of the remaining games. Yes. Any of them. Correct. Um, second thing, I think it was this. I don't remember. Um, Trevor Valise, shout out Trevor Valise. Um, I saw former yes. former producer at ESPN CU in Champaign now producer for the field of 68, which is crushing college basketball coverage. I love everything they do. He posted this earlier today that um, this has happened every year for the last four years yes. with Illinois, the combination of a bad loss and an explosive Brad Underwood post game. 2019, 20, 2019, 2020 season, it was the loss to Miami at home. Underwood said that he asked them about a scouting report question and none of them had an answer. 2020, 2021 was the loss to Mizzou in the bragging rights. Um, and he went off, talked about their lack of energy and, and hustle. Last season, lost against uh, Cincinnati. 
Um, we're off kilter. It's concerning. We're not playing with any confidence. And then this loss at home to Penn State where he did the fart noise and called out his entire team for their leadership. And look what's happened the last four seasons. Like, yeah. it's no need to freak out at this moment. Now, if this continues and he's still talking about this in a month when it's we're five or six games into Big Ten play, then you get concerned. But right now, shouldn't be concerned. Uh, Terrence Shannon came out and came, showed support for Brad. I mean, I guess that's the right word for it. Um, he said, you know, we have the best coach in the country. We'll be fine. Um, but got to find that leader. I don't know that Shannon is that because he's kind of laid back. I just I don't know who it's going to be, but um, I don't know that they know either. It just has to come naturally. If if it's not Shannon, I'm not sure who it is, but – you need it, but at the same time, I don't know that it's necessarily like the top priority. Um, let's talk about the the Brad Underwood fart noise comment. Um, the now uh, viral um, comment that he made, specifically in regards to Terrence Shannon, when he was asked by Jeremy Werder in the post game press conference, "What do you think of Terrence Shannon's leadership to this point?" and Brad answered mm. with a, "Yeah, that sound." Mm. Um, what what are your thoughts? I, there's a lot of uh, controversy uh, regarding that comment. Um, it seems to be very divided between the national and regional people as opposed to the local people. But how do you feel about it? Um, I don't know that the fart noise was necessary. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he has to figure out a way to to say it. He has to say it. Um, and if they're not showing it in practice, and if he's saying it in practice, they're not responding, then put it out in the public. Because <laughs> every single one of those guys, every sing- all 12 of those guys that put on the jersey every night for Illinois, they care about what people think about them. Like, they can say, you know, it's I, I don't read the papers, I don't read. They're all over social media. Like, they can get NIL now, so they're all over social media. They care about what the public thinks. So if Underwood goes out there and says publicly that you suck as a leader and you're not showing any – seniority in this group then maybe that'll change their perspective but maybe could have done without the fart noise in the middle of the question but um i don't have a problem with the response yeah let me ask you this what when you hear the term leadership in regards to a college basketball team what do you think of um is this just somebody that's vocal in the locker room is it somebody that's vocal on the floor in practice do they have to be your best player? Like, what do you think of when you hate, or is there a certain player that you think of when you, we hear talked that? about him Saturday, Trent Frazier. I mean, some he's the leader is an extension of the coach. When things are going wrong, the players don't necessarily need to run to the sideline and get in a huddle with their coach. They can huddle up on the court and say, all right, guys, this is what we need to do. You know, this is what we're doing wrong. This is what we need to fix. Someone that, is the coach on the floor, both schematically and mentally. Let me ask you another question. I don't know anything about these, the people on this team. I've never met any of these players on this team. All I know is what I've seen on the court and what I've heard in interviews and things like that. Is it possible that this team's leader is on the sideline in a boot? Very possible. That was Which my would shock point. me. It would I was shock going me. To, if, I was if... going to get into this. Leadership comes from culture and knowing, like I just said, Trent Frazier. Trent Frazier was in Champaign for five years. There are three guys on this team that were there last year. There are seven or eight new guys that have, this is, they've only been here for six months. They don't know Brad Underwood's style. One of them's Coleman Hawkins. I don't know. I mean, I think he can be a leader. I don't know that that's his mentality. He, I mean, he almost He's never left. had to be. He never had to be. And he almost left in the offseason. Like, he almost yeah. checked out and was no longer with the Illini program. Melendez, I just feel like he's timid as well. A leader needs to be vocal, needs to be out there, needs to be almost aggressive in their leadership. And I think Goody might be the best of the three options of the returners. The other guys are just new and they don't know. Now you don't have to be a five-year vet of the program. Like Terrence Shannon Jr. Could have came in day one and asserted that leadership. Like, Hey, 
this is how we do things. I've been to a NCAA tournament. I've been to a Sweet 16. I played against Duke last year in the Sweet 16. This is how it's done. Matthew Meyer won a national championship. But again, he wasn't here till August. He's been hurt. He hasn't been in the swing of things. Um, those those are the two guys, I think, just because they have been there. They have been to the second weekend. They need to be showing this team how it's done, how we got there. Maybe don't listen to um, Terrence Shannon Jr. when he says, hey, Chris Beard told me this, because we've learned that that's probably not the person you want to be listening to. But they know how to win in a tournament. They know what it takes to win. So it's got to be one of those two if it's not Luke Goody. A couple follow-ups to that. Maybe Brad was right when he said that Luke Goody was going to be in his starting lineup. Yeah. Um, because Luke Goody was the on-court leader. Maybe he was the vocal leader. He's not going to be your best player. Uh, he's not going to be one to light you up in the scorebook. Yeah, he'll hit some threes. Uh, he'll score you some points, but I don't know if he was ever going to be a lead by, you know, not necessarily lead by example, but that type of leader. Um, so maybe, maybe Brad meant something when he said that maybe he just was that. And two, um, probably just something that comes from again, having two freshman point guards Yeah. and the point guard is in theory, most all, always your floor general, your on field, your on court, you know, pseudo captain, pseudo captain, or like whatever. And this team's point guards are freshmen. So, I don't know. I don't think we need to discuss the leadership thing too much more than we already have. Um, I don't know how, yes, it's obviously important, but I don't know that it's like the reason why they lost that game. Um, I just think it's interesting because that was the comment that kind of went viral um, from Brad on Saturday. Um, Any other um, Tuesday or Saturday comments before we move on? Thoughts from you? No. Okay. I think I already mentioned it, but Illinois' next game is this coming Saturday uh, against Alabama A&M. Uh, it'll be in Champaign, 3 o'clock Central Time, 4 o'clock Eastern Time on Big Ten Network. Yes, Craig? Quiz. Pop quiz. What's their mascot? I have no idea. I didn't either until I looked them up on ESPN. What is it? The most common in all of sports. The Devils. The Bulldogs. <laughs> Bulldogs. Bulldogs. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know anything about them, but that game is on Saturday again after finals week. Uh, their upcoming schedule is Saturday against Alabama AM, and m then the following Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday? It's the 22nd. I believe it's Wednesday against um, Tuesday. Missouri. I don't know. It's against Mizzou, Missouri. Uh, and then they have one more game after Wait, Christmas. Wait, no, that's Thursday, I think. 22nd Thursday, I believe. Okay, whatever the case is. Uh, that makes sense. Yes, Thursday. Um, so Thursday against Mizzou, and then the following um, Saturday, or sometime after Christmas, against uh, Bethune-Cookman. Um, so that's the rest of the non-con schedule. Then they get into regular season Big Ten play in January. Uh, you can't lose to Alabama and a and uh, If you lose to Alabama and A&M, we have bigger issues on our hands. So... Hopefully they they know that and they get their is it together stuff and um, their stuff together and figure it out before that game uh, around the Big Ten Maryland who um, beat Illinois last week um, lost twice um, I don't remember who they played lost but... at Wisconsin and lost to Tennessee and New York. Yes. So only one of those was a conference game, but yeah, they've, it's been a lot of uh, everybody beating up each other around the country, not just in the big 10. And then Purdue uh, barely got by Nebraska. Did you watch that game? Another game of no, not really. Um, I saw a couple things, but. um, Just handed the game to Purdue. Just absolutely handed it to him down one. Well, first of all, Nebraska was, Getting it to overtime, Tomanaga, the uh, lefty for Nebraska, just the cojones on that dude. Jacked up a three with nine seconds left to tie it. Um, they held on to take it to overtime. And then in overtime, down one, Purdue inbounds the ball, and they are they speed him up, get him a little bit out of control, and he loses the ball right at the half court line. And the Nebraska guy just kind of sticks his arm out to try and get the ball. And 
milliseconds after the Purdue guy loses the ball and the Nebraska guy sticks his hand out, he hasn't made contact with the guy yet. Courtney Green calls a foul. Um and Purdue hits two free throws. Just one of the softest fouls. An anticipation foul call, which Courtney Green is is known for. Um, but Purdue should have Nebraska should have got the turnover there, had a like good fast break to take the lead. And uh, I was just annoyed because it was Purdue. And now yeah. they're the number one team in the country. But yes. fr- most fraudulent number one team in the country ever. Purdue unbeaten 10 and 0, uh, as Craig um angrily mentioned they are the number one team in the country and the most recent ap poll uh purdue won virginia who beat illinois is two yukon remains undefeated they are three i don't know how yukon's not one only three remaining undefeateds at least well no mississippi state's undefeated at least at the power five level uh people that are you know teams that are considered for the top 25 um so those are the top three alabama beat houston and they jumped up ahead of Houston in the number four spot. Uh, Texas fell five spots down to seven, but still because of the Penn State game remain 11 spots ahead of the Illini. Uh, Their coach is in some trouble. Um, I don't think we need to talk about that too much, but if you're unaware of what Chris Beard has done, uh, look him up. Not sure how that's going to go. Other teams of note, Indiana is 14. UCLA, uh, who... Illinois beat is now two spots ahead of the Illini at 16. Maryland uh, fell seven spots down to 20. Wisconsin is up to 22. Ohio State is 23. Um, And then I think you mentioned on here that Iowa and Michigan State are also in the receiving votes category. Did you see who else Um, is in receiving votes? uh, Let's look. Uh, Memphis, Charleston. Not what I'm um, talking about. Keep going. 27th in the country. Um, let's see who of note here. Am I supposed to be looking at who do you want me to talk about? There's a lot of teams here. Which one is it that is of note? They got four Creighton. votes. They got four points. Utah state. Nope. Then I'm looking at the wrong poll because okay. they, they must have corrected it. Because this morning when I went to it, let me see if they've corrected it. I'm looking at the I'm looking at what ESPN has. Okay, they must have corrected it because it was and Utah State is receiving votes at okay. Four votes. Go. I want I want to see the shock on your face when you see it. Go to collegepolltracker.com. Oh well, that's I actually have that up. Um, okay, right above um, Utah State. Hold on. Mississippi. (laughs) Okay, that's a mistake. (laughs) Mississippi Valley State, who's one in nine. uh, Okay, we talk about Ken Palm. There are 363 teams in Ken Palm, on Ken Palm, Division I basketball teams. Mississippi Valley State is 362. (laughs) Okay, that's a mistake. Uh, yes. Yeah, the that voter mistakenly that. clicked Mississippi Valley State instead of Mississippi State. Yeah, yeah, you'll get that. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to stay on this website because I was going to look at the net rankings, um, in which Illinois dropped quite a bit uh, after the loss. They are now 26. What were they before that game? Uh, in the teens. Okay. Yeah. Thirteen, so, maybe. All, all I see is the daily thing. So they're actually up two spots from where they were yesterday. Uh, we talked about it on the show. We kind of hy- hypothe- hypothesized, yeah, um, that the Penn State game was a quad two win. At the time, it was actually a quad three loss. It has since been upgraded to a quad two loss. Um, but those numbers obviously will fluctuate throughout the course of the season. So uh, Illinois seven and three now, uh, twenty six in the net, eighteen in the AP host. Alabama and M on Saturday, two more games after that before Big Ten conference play starts. Um, yeah, the Chris Beer thing, um, <laughs> that's messy. Uh, if you want to hear, learn about that, there are people that um, have done more reporting on that. Did you want to comment on Chris Beard, Greg? No, I mean, just say what happened. He was yeah. arrested. He was at arrested. Four o'clock in the morning for. Um... It was a domestic class three felony, I think, some sort of domestic abuse. Um, There was a report that it was his fiance. Um, He was in court today. 
He cannot be within 200 yards of her, 200 yards of the house. Of the victim. Um, he, of the victim, yeah. Whoever yeah, that is, whether it's her or not. Um, whoever. Yeah, cannot uh, – there was something else. Cannot do something. Uh, he he can he can have that. he can have contact, but it cannot be aggressive. It said, he can, which I thought he, was weird. Yes. Uh. So I think it was Dana O'Neill tweeted this out. Um. Listen to the zoom of Chris Bond's hearing yep. conditions. Must stay twenty two hundred yards away from victim. Can communicate via text, phone, but in non-threatening way. Yeah. And must stay two hundred yards away from house. Also, a protection order that goes until February tenth, twenty twenty-three. Yeah. So yeah. Um. The re- university released. did release a statement. Um. Yes, he has been released from. Um, from the from jail or whatever. Um, but I don't remember. Texas released a statement. It didn't really say much at the time. Basically, said they were looking into it, and yep. that was about it. So I don't believe he's been punished. They play tonight. Like by the time this comes out, they'll be on the court. I would expect him not to be on. He the He will line. not be. He will not be there tonight. Um, I don't know who his top assistant is, but somebody else will be. Uh, well, I thought headlining. Jaren's Howard was there. Was he with him? He was oh, last year, but he's I'm, gone. I am just reacting in real time to Twitter changing this whole thing again. Holy smokes. <laughs> the I'm so annoyed. It's yellow now. What the heck? Ugh, whatever. No, I'm I'm over it. Um, I just want I did my bad. Point that out so- my bad says it's um you may or may not be notable. Congratulations. Yeah, may or may not it's a legacy. You're a legacy verification. May not or may or may not be notable. And you may <laughs> or may not be notable. So congratulations, Craig. You may or may not be notable. <laughs> um all right, we're gonna move on to Illini football. Um bowl game is a couple weeks away still, but we did have um awards that were announced this past weekend. Uh, along with the Heisman, which did not go go to an Illini as much as we hoped it would. Um, will it ever? Will Illinois ever win a Heisman? I don't know. Uh, Illinois is not the type of program that wins those awards. I mean, as, it's hard to, as we saw. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, it's hard to say never, but I think at some point it's somebody might. Um, but the two Illini that were up for major award consideration uh, did not win those um, their respective awards as we kind of anticipated Devin Weatherspoon and Chase Brown uh, Chase was up for uh, basically running back of the year and Weatherspoon was up for the defensive back of the year um, neither of them won but they were at least uh, final three um, nominees so uh, Spoon got robbed that's yeah I mean probably but like still <laughs> let's be honest with ourselves I mean just the fact that they're in this conversation um Illinois football is leaps and bounds ahead of where it was a few years ago so um in a in conjunction with that the AP all Americans came out today I believe um there was Devin Witherspoon was a first team all American selection from the AP uh Chase Brown was a second team Johnny Newton was second team and uh who else Kalchesky. Um uh, Kalchesky was named uh third. third team. Um so still I mean for all Americans um that's tremendous. <laughs> I know we wanted this season to go a little different um but we we can't fool ourselves here. That's four all Americans uh from this one team to go with the however many individual players that were selected all conference uh, to have four all Americans is pretty incredible. Uh, and Witherspoon is also the first consensus All American since 2015 when Whitney Merciless. Yeah, I yeah. mean that's um, that's pretty great, pretty great. Michael Michael Martin, the sideline guy for Illini Radio, uh, former Illini from Champaign, has a good Twitter thread on that. He had he had been keeping up with the All American stuff. Um, I don't know what his Twitter handle is. I think it's I, I don't know what it is. Michael Martin on on twitter i don't know see if you can find his handle while i'm talking but um when they did the renovations they um put up plaques of all the all americans and there hasn't been a new one since 2015 with merciless and i believe in the thread he said that every single one 
has gone into the college football hall of fame, except for merciless. Um, because I don't think he was been eligible yet, but, um, he was all, all sorts of giddy about getting a consensus all American consensus means, um, there are five all American teams. And I think you have to get three of the five to be considered consensus. So this one gives spoon his third first team all American. So, yeah, I, I don't know how he didn't win the Thorpe, but he's going to be a first round, second round pick probably first but also did you see what robert rosenthal tweeted today uh i had i had forgotten this apparently not no um do you remember the wisconsin game the upset it was the fourth quarter and wisconsin hit a slant route and the dude had a was walking into the end zone and got tripped up at the goal line, and Illinois forced the three, forced the field goal instead of the touchdown. Okay, yeah, that was Witherspoon that made the shoestring tackle as a true freshman. Oh, he made okay. the shoestring tackle to keep them off the board. They only got three, so hmm. it was a six point game, or a, whatever it was. And Illinois was able to come back and win because he forced a field goal, got the tackle. That was him. Now he's an All American. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, he's had quite the run. He's had quite the run. He's been a he's a member of the team for a while. So good for him. Yeah. Whatever happens next. Um, glad question, that he's finally getting his dues. Yes. Question now for Illinois football. Ryan Walters, the defensive coordinator. Next year, there are still plenty of open jobs. Speaking of, he's been named coordinator of the year by multiple publications, national coordinator of the year, which that's incredible. Up for the Broyles, did not win the Broyles, went to Garrett Riley. But I mean, Purdue is is open now. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think there's another. I don't I don't think he would make the jump from uh, Big Ten coordinator to SEC head coach. But I've seen crazier things because there's going to be a job come open here in the next couple of days. Um. Yeah, but there are still jobs open. He yeah. is still interviewing. He has not signed an extension. I'm starting to get worried that Walters might. I mean, not I think be it's certainly possible. Next year. I, I think I don't think he makes the jump if it's not a um, power five school. Um, but as you said, there are power five jobs open. So do you think um, Purdue could look at it as addition by subtraction? We're adding our head coach <laughs> and taking away <laughs> Illinois' strongest assistant. I mean, it could. I mean, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I I don't know that that's what's going to happen, but I mean, it's certainly on the table. Um, yeah. I I I I tend to think that he's not going to go anywhere this year, but I understand why you are concerned, and I think you have every right to be concerned because I think it's certainly still possible. What 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 positions are open right now? We know Purdue's open. Did Georgia Tech fill it, or was it Georgia, Georgia Tech? Tech they filled their Georgia spot? Tech filled with with their interim. Okay. Um, what else is open? I mean, we don't, we can't speculate too much about Mississippi State, which we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, I don't know what else. Auburn is open? filled. Filled. Nebraska filled. Filled. Wisconsin filled. Filled. Louisville filled. Yes, filled. Arizona State, filled. Oh, yeah, they filled. Stanford, filled. Sorry, I missed that. I think think they filled it, yeah. Stanford is filled. I missed that one. Georgia Tech is filled. Cincinnati is filled. Colorado, talked about that. Purdue is the best job remaining open. USF is filled. North Texas is open. He won't take North Texas. So Purdue might be the only power five at the moment. I'll go with no, but you obviously can't rule it out because it is a power five job that is open. And Did you see who UAB hired? Uh, yeah. Uh, Trent Dilfer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another one an straight one. from the media world. Navy but is I, open now. Some stuff, but yeah. Okay. I don't know. I I still say no, but yeah, I think it's certainly possible. And if he does stick around for another year, I think that will probably be his last year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mike Leach. Let's talk about the Mississippi State thing. Um, Mike Leach, head coach for Mississippi State, had a massive heart attack 
Is that how it was described on Sunday yesterday? Yes. Um, kind of came out of nowhere. I saw a report that he was just at a holiday event and everything seemed fine. Um, and it doesn't sound like things are very good for him. Um, so this is obviously um, a sad thing for the college football world. We'll have to see, you know, where what happens here. Uh, the last update that Mississippi State football tweeted out, which was at about 1138 this morning, Eastern time, um, said that he remains in critical critical condition at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson. His family is with them and appreciates the overwhelming expressions of love and support for the coach, but also requests that their family's privacy be respected at this time. That's the extent of the information that MSU has available regarding Coach Leach's condition, and the university will make their no other comment at this time. MSU will issue additional information via social media when it becomes available. Uh, not good. Not good. Um, Mike Leach is, is quite a character um, in the world of college football. I know he's very well, um, very much um, respected and beloved by a lot of the people in that community, both in the SEC and elsewhere. Um, and honestly, obviously, this is of note because Mississippi State is who Illinois plays in the ReliQuest Bowl um, coming up here on at January 2nd Um, so not that that's the most important thing at play here but that is obviously something of note for people that listen to this show Um, yeah it's kind of sad I mean it's very sad I mean we'll see what happens but um, not looking good not looking promising I've been reading the Mississippi State message boards on 24-7 and their guys are saying that it's all but it's all but done um, the, his family is at his side and they have some, de- they have some decisions to make is what, um, I think one way that they worded it. So one of those things that you see it like coming out on Twitter and you're like, wait, no, 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 it's not that bad. This, it can't be that bad. And then as the night went on last night, more and more started coming out like, oh yeah, this is, this is really bad. This is a lot worse than we expected. Um, there was a report. Did you read the report? Sorry, I was I was checking the message boards to see. I just I read the the update that they tweeted out today at um, eleven thirty. There was a report that he had a massive heart attack last night and didn't receive medical attention for fifteen to twenty minutes, and so the oxygen to his brain has what was very depleted, and they defibrillated him a couple times and got him back and got him to the hospital, but haven't been able to improve since then so yeah it's going to be a sad day uh either later tonight or tomorrow um we're recording this about six o'clock on a monday night so if nothing's happened before then but yeah it just sucks um i don't know what else to say about it it's just he's been fun for college football for 20 years that text those Texas Tech offenses with Michael Crabtree and Graham Harrell and um who is the other Texas Tech gunslinger? Cliff Kingsbury. Uh, those teams were so much fun. And then yeah. he made Washington State relevant and then he tried his hand at the SEC and obviously it gained some pretty good success at the SEC. Going going eight and four in that conference is quite a feat. But um yeah, it just sucks. His his press conferences were always funny always entertaining yeah uh obviously he's, he's been a he's a he's a character and i know a lot of people um just really uh respected him and enjoyed him and uh yeah it's very sad um certainly not what you wanted to wake up to on sunday or on monday morning like i and most people did uh not the news you wanted to see um but yes, obviously this does in, impact Illinois football, who is supposed to play Mississippi State coming up here in a couple weeks. Um, TBD on how that affects that. Um, okay, the Heisman Trophy was announced on Saturday. Um, I don't want to say it was a shock, because um, it certainly wasn't a shock uh, that Caleb Williams won. Um, I think at, by the time that the announcement was finally made, I think he was about the only clear front runner. Um, I think that, yeah, he was a massive favorite. I think that, uh, the other candidates, CJ Stroud and whoever, Max Duggan kind of almost eliminated themselves. Um, but yeah, Caleb Williams took home the Heisman trophy on Saturday. 
Um, good for USC. Back to back to national relevance. Uh, came really close to making the playoff, and now have a another. Lincoln Riley has yet another Heisman Trophy winning quarterback. Three out of the last six. He has a, and then also has a, a first runner up in there too. I think, if I'm correct, I think that's J- what Jalen Hurts. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, that would so make sense. Pretty, uh, pretty good resume for Lincoln. So. Uh, yeah, good for Caleb Williams, good for USC. He's the Heisman Trophy winner. Um, who? What was their finishing order? Do you remember? Uh, Duggan was second. Stroud third, Bennett fourth. Does which, that surprise you? I was surprised Bennett even got invited. He had worse stats this year than he did last year, and he wasn't invited last year. His stats were better last year. Yeah, and I don't, this is the year he got invited. He is I was not Heisman worthy. I was surprised when I saw that he was the one invited. We haven't had a chance that, to talk about this because that was no. announced after our show, right? We need the Heisman voting needs um what's the word? Not renovated. We need to rethink the Heisman voting because Hendon Hooker, even though he got hurt, way better quarterback. Blake Corum, way better player than Setson Bennett. Are you looking at the list? I'm I'm sure am, Bennett yeah. was like tenth. Should have been tenth on the list of ten. Who was behind Corum and Hooker? Um, okay. So we talked about the top four. Hooker was five. Right. Bryce Young was six. That was the other one. That was Corum the other one. Corum was seven. Uh and at that point it doesn't really matter. Um, he, Seth Bennett had Washington the worst in there. stats. Bijan Robinson was in there. Drake May was tenth. I would um, put Bennett behind all of them. Stetson Bennett, for what it's worth, finished with 111 first place votes, or thir- sorry, third place votes. Oh, um, I was going to say, holy cow, third third place votes. No first he, or second though, right? Oh no, he had first and second. He had yeah. first. Someone voted for him to win the Heisman. He had 36 uh, first place. Oh my god. Votes or points or however they do that. Yeah. How many people vote for this thing? Uh Brett Barron's is a Heisman voter. Joey Wagner's a Heisman voter. 870 media members. So yes, 36 people voted Stetson Bennett first. Yeah. That's, 36. That's he sad. also got uh 65 second place votes and 111 third place votes. That's sad. um I agree. It should it Hendon Hooker should have been fourth. He should have been the one there. Um that's I He might win the damn thing if he didn't get hurt. That's that's the part I think that bothers me the most. Um it's not necessarily that Caleb Williams won. I mean Max Duggan finishing second. Okay, whatever. Um but yeah, it was the fact that Hendon Hooker wasn't even invited um finishing fifth, which whatever. Um and then the other big news from the world of college football, as we kind of touched on, is that Jeff Brom, as speculated, as we talked about on this show last week, is headed back to Louisville. Uh, how has, has the parade started yet down there, Craig? How's the celebration been? How's the uh, re- the reception been that uh, it's been a, a homecoming um, for good old Jeff? Someone made the joke on the radio um, leading up to his press conference on Friday where he was introduced, no, Thursday, Thursday, when he was introduced, um, there were more people at Brahms press conference in the, in one of the clubs of Cardinal stadium. There were more people there than at the Louisville men's basketball game the night before. <laughs> um, that tells you where Louisville's uh, heads are at right now. Um, I, I think this tells you all you need to know. Um, Louisville got paid for Satterfield to leave and then ended up with the better coach. Louisville made money to hire a better coach. So that's all you need to know. Um, There was one negative. He did lose a top uh, 30 prospect. They had the number one running back in the the country in the class of 2023 committed to Louisville. Um, He decommitted. Monday night, I believe, after Satterfield uh, left and then four hours later committed to Texas A&M. So that tells me that he wasn't coming to Louisville anyways or very unlikely when you commit somewhere four hours after you decommit um, in that situation. They haven't lost anyone else, I don't think. But, I mean, it's a home run hire. And I said it. 
I don't know if I said it on the show. I believe I did that it had to be Brom. It couldn't be anyone else because if it was anyone else, the same thing would happen to them that happened to Satterfield where you're not Jeff Brom. We want Jeff Brom. You're not Jeff Brom. You cannot do any right unless you win the ACC every year and start beating Clemson. And if you don't, then everyone starts saying, hey, you're not Jeff Brom. Um, But Brom was talking like this was always the plan. Um, This is where he's from. He went to high school at Trinity just down the street here, uh, played at Louisville, um, played in the NFL for, I think he said, seven years. Coached His first coaching job was a like an AFL team based here in Louisville or some sort of football team professional based here in Louisville coached at Western Kentucky just down the street. Um, so it was always kind of his plan. Just the first go around wasn't the right time. And now it was the right time. Um, his kids love it here. His kids wanted to move back here. So um, this is where his family's at. I think it's a home run. I think what's the better job to you. Did we talk about this last week? I think we talked about this last week. I'm pretty sure we did. Um, Probably. Um, I don't remember what I said, but I think I probably would have said Purdue. Right. And that's, um, I think that's what everyone kind of thought. I believe I also just said go wherever, like in, in that situation where it's fairly comparable, go where you want to be. If right. one of them is going home, go home. Right. We're not talking, as I said, we're not talking about leaving Ohio State to go to Louisville. We're not right. talking about leaving Michigan. We're not talking about leaving USC or Alabama, like we're talking about leaving Purdue. So if you're talking about Purdue and Louisville are your two options here, theoretically, hypothetically, um, and one of them is returning home, if that's where you want to be, go home. Like there's, I have zero issues with that, regardless of what you think is the better program, because there's a good chance that whatever you think is the better program, whatever, regardless of what you think, it probably isn't that much of a difference. And anybody's met stretch, like how you envision it. So I think he's more likely to gain national relevance and prominence at Louisville than he is at Purdue with what the big 10 is getting ready to go through. That's and probably I think true. That's probably another draw to him, but yeah. um, long story short, I know none of our listeners really care about what's going on with Louisville athletics, but um, long story short, home run hire, grand slam hire, the only hire that could be made. Um, I really want to talk to some of the media members down here and ask them if, the eight if the Louisville AD's phone, if he dialed any number except for Jeff Brom. That's I'm really curious if he ever had to go to his plan B or if it was always this is the only person I'm calling until he says no. Probably. I would hope that was the case. Be my guess. Speaking of Louisville, Um, volleyball, final four. Whoop whoop. Congratulations. Louisville (laughs) volleyball. Um, also, speaking of Louisville, they play a football game this weekend against uh, Cincinnati. Um, so I did this last week. Awkward turtle. Yeah, Awkward. that's going to be a dandy of a game <laughs> um, for for a few people involved. Um, but let's talk about it. Pick your pick. Um, we had one game last week, Army Navy game. Uh, we both got it wrong. The Army won that, correct? Twenty Army or, won, yeah. Army 20 won twenty seventeen, yeah. and we both picked Navy, so we both went zero at one. Um, bringing my current record to 42 and 30 and Craig at 40 and 32. So I have a two game lead over him for pick your pick. I haven't um, told you this. I'm starting a group on ESPN for college bowl mania and going to tweet it out. So listeners, the invite. if I haven't created it yet, uh, listeners, we're going to do a contest. No, no, no prize money, just bragging rights. Uh, we'll tweet it out and join us, make your picks and uh, we'll see who's the smartest of us all. Of the what is it 40, 40 bowl games forty one bowl games something maybe like that yeah, something like that remember. I'm doing it Logan you don't have to get involved but I'm doing it well, so I will, here I will we go. certainly do it I will certainly participate uh, but either way we're doing six games we're picking six games this week the six games that are this weekend between Friday and Saturday there's a few more than the than the ones we're picking but yeah um, these are the ones we're gonna do so Friday the Duluth Trading Cure Bowl uh, UTSA and Troy. Um, and then on Saturday, the Fenway Bowl, Cincinnati and Louisville, as we discussed. Uh, the Las Vegas Bowl is Florida and Oregon State. The Jimmy Kimmel LA Bowl, presented by Stifle. How many sponsors do you need? Is Washington State versus Fresno. New Mexico Bowl, SMU and BYU and Frisco, the Frisco Bowl, North Texas and Boise State. Who's picking first this week, Craig? I have no clue. We'll just restart in the opposite person. We're picking them all. We're picking them all. Just real quick. 
Picking them all. Oh, we're, we're not going to do the normal thing? Nope. Nope. Oh. I'm taking okay. UTSA. Uh, so I am also picking that game. That's yep. what you're telling me right now. Yep. Okay. Um, I will take Troy. Okay. Okay, okay. move on. Um, Louisville. Cincinnati's had a lot of people leave. Um, Louisville's probably the safe bet. Um, I'll take Cincinnati just to be different. But yeah, you're probably safe on that one. I'm taking Florida. SEC is better than the Pac-12. I will take Oregon State. Um, I think SEC is better than the Pac-12, but I think Oregon State is better than Florida. Uh, all right, move on. Fresno, upset here. I don't know. I don't know the line. I don't know if that's an I, upset. I feel like it's maybe not. Fresno. Um, I'll take Washington State. I want to be this different, is, man. This is be good. Different. This is good. Good, good content. Um, uh, all right. What else? SMU, this BYU. One I, this one I don't know. BYU had a lot of expectations this year, and they have not played well. Uh, I'll take BYU though. Fine, I'll take SMU. Now these are what you have to put on the ESPN thing too. Yeah, you're gonna have to remind me. Um, <laughs> and then what's the last one we're doing? Boise, uh, Boise State, and North Texas. You're taking Boise. Yeah, I will also take Boise. I'll there stick you with go. you on one of them. There you go. Um, so we did great. Only one of them we matched on. Uh, and that's wonderful. Love it. Okay. Love it. Let's move on. Uh, Major League Baseball. Um, Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. Uh, so Wilson, winter meeting Wilson, Wilson. taking place. Um, trades have happened. Free Not as many as I expected, though. Uh, big one happened today. I think yeah. the biggest move, biggest trade of the offseason, I think, so far happened today, uh, which we will talk about. Um, yes. Um, Wilson Contreras uh, signed with the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, do you want me to start this, or do you want to start this? Do you want to start the floor as the, is yours. the old? We'll end the on a happy home. note. We'll end on end the conversation on a happy um, note. I speak for I think most every Cub fan when I say I'm very sad by this. Um, we have known Wilson Contreras was going to be gone for a while. Um, the Cubs have made it very, very known. Um, that they wanted to um, prioritize different aspects to the catching position than what Wilson Contreras brought to the table. Um, we have already given this man multiple send-offs. Um, he miraculously wasn't traded at the deadline, I guess, thanks to Dusty Baker. Um, and so I and everybody else knew that he was gone. I don't think there was any shock there. The shock here is that it ended up being the Cardinals. And it should even really be a shock. It was always going to be – it seemed like it was the Cardinals or the Astros. I think everyone was just hoping it was the Astros so that the Cubs wouldn't have to see him however many times a year in a their rival's uniform. Um, but it, it does – it sucks. It sucks for Cubs fans because he was very much beloved by this organization. And he's – I'm happy for him. I'm happy that he's going to get the chance to go somewhere and compete because let's face it. The Cubs aren't competing right now. Um, they, they may try to act like they are, but they have yet to show any sort of evidence that they are actually trying to compete. So I'm happy for him. Um, as I've said before, I hope Cardinals fans appreciate him. Like he deserves to be appreciated. I've said it once and I'll say That's it. That's the exact more text I got the other day from Logan. He is, <laughs> appreciate he is, him. He's not Yadier Molina. And if you expect him to be Yachty or Molina, you're going to be in for a world of hurt. Um, but he does a lot more from the offensive side of things than Yachty ever did. Um, but you don't need him to be a superstar. The Cubs, he was the best player on the Cubs. And after they got rid of everybody, he's going to a Cardinals team where he can hit fifth, have very little pressure. I mean, there's plenty of pressure, but like he's the already like no better than the third best offensive player on that team probably like fourth or fifth and you don't need him to be anything more than that so i'm happy for i'm happy for wilson it sucks that it's it's not that it sucks that it's your favorite team it just sucks that it's the team that i don't want him to succeed for so uh, i wish him nothing but the best except for when he plays the cubs go on you can you can now celebrate or whatever you want to do I've said this for years. I believe I've said it to you specifically. This 2015 to 20, I guess, 2021 
era of the Cubs was difficult for me because as a franchise, I'm supposed to hate everything about Chicago. But Chris Bryant, Javi Baez, Anthony Rizzo, Wilson Contreras, I loved watching them play. I lo- As a Cardinal fan, I loved those guys. It was a fun group. So for one of them to now be a Cardinal, I'm ecstatic. Um, and I, I am fully aware that we are not getting a gold glove catcher. We are not getting a great game calling catcher. We're not, we're not getting that. Um, the one thing I will say though, a lot of people are talking about front pitch framing and the, like he doesn't receive the ball. Well, pitch framing has gone next year. Like it's not going to matter. So who cares about that? He has a cannon for an arm. He's still going to throw people out. People are going to start trying to steal more because the bases are bigger. You're closer to second base when you're getting your first base, when you're getting your lead off of first, people are going to start trying to steal. I love it. I love it. I absolutely love it. I think the contract is pretty friendly. I think it's like 17 and a half per year. I think that's that's pretty good. Um, but I think I just love most, and we saw this from Yachty, the la- I guess kind of throughout his career. He's fiery and, and stuff. Contreras is like next level. He's even more. And even those on the outside, I think, can say that the Cardinals, you know, the Cardinal way, you know, you don't celebrate home runs. Cardinals don't do bat flips. Like, I mean, they're, they certain they do at certain times. But like, I feel like the outside perception is the Cardinals are very buttoned up and like we do it this way and that's how we do it. And Contreras is not that. That's what I'm looking forward to most is that he is just going to be a firecracker loves to play baseball, loves to have fun and put a jolt in this dugout. And also it's a bat. What was my what was my complaint for most of the the postseason or most of the second half of the season? There's no pop. Yeah, outside it was of Arenado Tommy Edmond, Brandon yeah. Brendan Donovan, Lars New like Outside of Goldschmidt and Arenado, no one was really a home run threat other than late in the year when Juan Yepes kind of got a hold of a couple. This gives this is an offensive move. I think I keep saying Illinois when I talk here. Um, the Cardinals have one of the best defensive teams in the um, in the in Major League Baseball. So it's okay if they put the ball in play. It's okay if the batter puts the ball in play. You've got guys that will that will make the play and get the out. So I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I was on the fence because there was that, that, that possibility that the Cardinals trade for Sean Murphy and then sign a Dansby Swanson or something and really shore things up. Um, I think once you sign Contreras, that went out the window and I'm totally okay with it. I'm totally fine with it. I love it. My jersey will be here in like three days. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, two two more Wils, Wils, Wilson Contreras things. Um, we'll talk about William here briefly um, before we go or before we move on. Um, oh, before I, there, was, there was one more thing. Oh, um, I, I had their fan graphs pulled up. We were talking about you know not not the defensive type of thing. Um, fan graphs defensive fielding and positional adjustment. Yadi had a twelve last year. Um, the highest of his career was like. 48 in 2010 so even he fell off uh wilson's was negative 0.4 so there's that (laughs) so Um, those cardinal fans listening realize it's not gonna be the same (laughs) it's it's not it's just not i love wilson um but uh two two things one in regards to his defense it does say a lot when john lester who was Yep, known for only using David Ross as his catcher for yep. so many years, um, basically approved of Wilson Contreras to be his personal catcher for the last however many years after Ross left, after Ross retired. So the last two or three years in Chicago, Wilson Contre- Contreras was essentially David jo- or John Lester's personal catcher. I think that says something. Offensively, I've already said it on the show before. If you give him the opportunity to spend plenty of time as your DH you will see more production from him offensively. If you are forcing him to catch every single day um, and you're going to see lackluster defense and he may not hit that well, that's where you have the problem. This is one of his best offensive seasons he's ever had. And it's because he had a lot of opportunities to DH. 
if you set that up for him, if you have a good enough defensive backup catcher that can help split him time, split time with him, and you can send him, make him your your DH for a health a healthy helping of games, I think you're going to see really good Wilson Contreras numbers. If you don't have that, I can't promise you you're going to see good Wilson Contreras numbers. 70, 72 games as a catcher, thirty nine games as DH last year. Yeah, I think you need to see something similar to that. Who's the who's the Cardinals backup catcher? Kisner. I'm looking him up right now to see how many games he played this year. I mean, whatever. Because I, Yachty, Yachty did Yachty did get hurt at one point. And, and I'm not trying to say that bit. Wilson can't do both at the same time, but what I'm saying is that this has been one of his best offensive seasons, and you have to think that that factored into it. Because, Kisner played because, in 96 games last year. So he'll he'll catch a good 60. He'll be fine. He'll, he'll be, be fine. fine. Um, all right. Other moves. The Cubs – did make some moves. Uh, Cody Bellinger, Jamison Tyone are coming to Chicago. Bellinger on a one-year, 17-whatever-million-dollar deal. I know he's been – I've seen I've seen it multiple times that he's Jason Hayward 2.0. I, it's, I don't think that's the same conversation. Um, but uh, you know what? If that's how you want to think of it, then go ahead by all means. Um, how, Cody okay, Bellinger – Why are you so I, – I, I was one of those. I tweeted you it. You were. You were, and I saw it two or three times within the span of 20 minutes. Where's the difference? This is a one-year contract. Oh, that's Jason not what I'm talking Hayward about. I'm talking about, the, years. I'm talking about the player. I'm talking about have, the player. I would have gladly gave Jason Hayward $17 million for one year to play gold glove defense at age 27. Are you kidding me? Like, I would have loved to do that. Like, I understand what you're saying because they had similar tra- career trajectories. They were – Gold Glove MVP players as for like three seasons, and then they like fell off hard. Maybe that's exactly what Cody Bellinger is. It's very possible, but in terms of how the Cubs look at this, like it is, there is no comparison. Like this is a one year deal. We locked Jason Hayward into six years or whatever it was when he and we are now eating the last year of that contract. This is a one year deal with Cody Bellinger. For the Cubs, the Cubs need a center fielder who can play great defense and a power hitting left handed bat. If he can play gold glove, de- gold glove defense and provide some sort of productivity from the middle of the order as a left-handed bat, that's a win. If he can get any, anywhere close at all, like within within miles of what he was back in 2017 or whenever he had his MVP season 2018, that's a that's a win. I mean, at this point, the way the Cubs have built in there doesn't look like they're going to add anybody else. Best case scenario is the Cubs trade him for prospects in June. I mean, it's I don't think there's any chance that he sticks around if he's productive at all. Um, I'm yes. strictly talking the type of player. No, I get handed defensive player that's 215 and strikes out a ton and hits 20. I, that's I all. Under- that's my two. Players. I understand it. I understand it. It was just I. Yeah. From from the the move itself um there's really no comparison but i i understand what you're saying um either way when that happened and the tyone uh the jameson tyone signing happened i was excited i thought all right we're making moves we're gonna go somewhere and then nothing has happened um sandra bogarts has gone to san diego uh trey turner who wasn't really on the cubs radar I, I know we'll get there. Uh, Trey Turner went I to. Fit, I was went just to correcting Phillies. myself. Uh, now Sean Murphy has now been dealt. He was another name that I saw thrown around. Um, Carlos Correa is still out there. Uh, has not has yet to sign anywhere. We'll see where he goes. Dansby Swanson is still out there, although I don't think he is the offensive upgrade for the Cubs, and I'm not even sure that he's that much of a stronger defensive player than than Nico Horner. So I don't know. I, I, I don't I don't see that one really making a lot of sense for where the Cubs are at right now. Um, the Cubs, I just fear, are really taking the whole there's always next year thing a little too literal right now. I thought during last year's offseason, we were playing for 2023. And I think that's how Cub fans saw it. They I think the Cub fans saw this as we have a good enough farm system at like the high double A, triple A spot. We've added a couple guys. We brought in Seiya Suzuki. Let's play for 2023. We'll, you know, we'll we'll just kind of, you know, eat the money on 2022. We'll just let that season happen. 2023, we'll go after one of these short stops. We'll really improve. I know it's only December 12th and a lot of things could happen, including Carlos Correa or whatever else they could do. But like, I just don't see that as 
I just don't see that happening. I think that it's very possible that Cody Bellinger and Jamison Tyone, as great of players as they are and can be, I think that's probably going to be the Cubs' big additions this offseason. And that's not enough to help win you baseball games. It's just not. They don't have nearly enough around them. Um, I mean, yeah, you can hope Ian Happ continues to build off what he did the past season. You can hope that Seiya Suzuki, you know, gets a little more consistent. Uh, Nico Horner turns into a real stud at shortstop. Like, you can hope all those things. And I think it's possible that some of those things happen. Uh, Christian Vasquez is still out there. I think that they'll have to add a catcher to some type. I think it's going to have to be Christian Vasquez. I don't know who else is even out there. Um, I, I just, I tend to think optimistically, like, like Jed Hoyer or whoever in this situation, in this scenario is like going to get it like figured out and be able to do the things necessary. And that's just not really been the case right now. So it's kind of annoying, kind of frustrating. It's a weird time in Cubs baseball. It's a weird time. Uh, We're running out of time. Let's just run through this here. Aaron Judge Judge stays with the Yankees. Not a huge shock. The Giants were in play. Um, John Heyman tweeted it out. Craig got blocked because of it. Um, he blocked Arson me Judge and block Craig. He's so <laughs> proud. Uh, the big deal today, Sean Murphy, as we talked about the catcher for the A's is headed to Atlanta, uh, three team deal. William Contreras, Wilson's brother headed to Milwaukee. So now both Contreras brothers are in the New York or in the NL central central there to torment the Cubs. Craig, anything else from you? Nope. All right, let's shut it down for Craig. I'm Logan. No one asked us. We'll see you on. I don't know when there's a line of game Saturday, maybe a post game. Maybe not. We'll talk to you later. Bye.